Okay, so we can move on to, to our next talk um, uh, by Dr. Denis Dufour. Um, it's called The Winding Road from a Degree in Physics to the Development of Leading Edge Optical Sensors. So take it away, Denis. Thank you. So uh, do you see? No, nope, you have to share your screen. Yeah, just, right. How is it now? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my name is Denis Dufour. I'm an application scientist at INO, which is the Institut National d'Optique or National Optic Optics Institute in English. And uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about how um, my degree in physics led me to uh, an interesting career developing all kinds of, of sensors uh, for industry. So, um, yeah, so this uh, that's the goal of my talk today. And I'm gonna, along the way, show uh, some of the skills and knowledge that I picked up along the way, uh, both at university and through various jobs that I've had uh, that have been uh, useful for me, uh, for, uh, for industry. And uh, along the way, talk a bit about some of those uh, sensors and interesting technologies that I've had the, uh, the privilege to develop uh, throughout the years. So uh, we'll start at the beginning. Um, I, uh, I did a, my bachelor's degree in, in physics at the University, University of Moncton, uh, graduated in 93. This was uh, sort of pre-internet era, so I didn't really have a clue about what kind of job I would do afterwards. Um, but uh, I basically was interested in physics, so I figured that things would, would sort themselves out. <laughs> Nowadays, I think, uh, you know, Obviously, with the internet, people can have a bit better idea of, of what's out there, but I, I uh, was a bit in the dark back then. So anyway, uh, however, I was very interested in astronomy. Um, and uh, when I was trying to, I wanted to do a master's degree, I went to, to Kingston, uh, Queen's University to look to, uh, I applied for uh, an astronomy master's degree and sort of had, having second thoughts about, well, what kind of job am I gonna do with this? And I decided to maybe look at things that are perhaps more applied physics and ended up um, doing a master's degree in the applied magnetics group at Queen's University. And that was a large research group that had a lot of ties to uh, the pipeline inspection industry. So I figured, okay, well, maybe this is a way for me to, uh, to get a job afterwards. And it's sort of like in the interface of, of it's applied physics slash engineering. And uh, I worked on uh, the design of magnetic flux leakage tools for inspecting uh, pipelines, which I'll talk about after. And one thing that I want to highlight, so in these slides, uh, I highlight some things in green, which are kind of like skills that I picked up by doing, uh, in this case, in my master's uh, degree, uh, that ended up being very useful for me uh, later on. So I just thought I'd highlight those. So at the time, well, this was like in the uh, mid 90s. Uh, I picked up, you know, MATLAB, LabVIEW, learned about electronics, uh, machining, finite element analysis, all these kinds of things served me later on um, in, my, in my later job. So I think that's one of the messages that I'm going to highlight at the end is, you know, when you're doing your physics, think about skills like this that are, are very translatable to, uh, to different, um, different fields or jobs afterwards. So after this, um, my master's degree, I actually got a job for um, a pipeline inspection company, uh, which was called Pipetronics in Toronto. And I worked with uh, for them as a magnetic specialist. And uh, what that meant is I helped develop uh, algorithms and things for uh, correlating magnetic flux leakage signals from uh, the pipeline um, pigs that they call them. They're the uh, inspection vehicles. To, uh, and doing various experiments to try to, to correlate the signals uh, to figure out if the pipelines were damaged. So it's just an example here of what these sensors look like. So uh, essentially you have a very strong magnet or a series of them. Uh, um, sorry, sorry, Denis, are you changing yep. slides? Because I, I'm not sure if any, does anybody else see? Because I don't see a change. Oh. I'm still on your first opening slide with your name on it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should be on slide four. Uh, maybe let me, uh, I'm going to stop sharing and start again. I'll try a different way. Okay. Sorry about that.
How is this? Uh, yep. Now we're in a different slide. Slide four. Okay, great. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is just, uh, as I was talking about, um, to show you um, uh, how this worked, this technology works. So you essentially you have a series of strong magnets that uh, saturate the, uh, the pipeline wall. And whenever there's defects, uh, you can uh, detect them using uh, an array of hall sensors. And so, uh, you know, I did a lot of work uh, trying to optimize uh, these, uh, these things and also how to, um, how to correlate uh, what you're reading, uh, the sensor reading into the actual pit or defect uh, size and geometry. So I did that for a few years and then uh, decided to change tact. And uh, uh, so I, I, this was because I, I met a few people who were uh, at the University of Toronto working in, uh, in the atmospheric remote sensing group and who are who are building uh, satellite instruments. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. I'd like to get into that. So um, I applied uh, to get a job as a research associate uh, in the Atmospheric Remote Sensing Group. And this is a position that didn't exist. I just basically presented myself to, uh, to who later became my, uh, my PhD supervisor, Jim, Jim Drummond. And I said, you know, these things are really interesting. Satellite, uh, do you would you have a job for me? And essentially what got me my job was the fact that I picked up things. He said, do you know MATLAB and LabVIEW? And I said, yes. So he says, you can, uh, you can uh, come on board. So I worked for a while on, um, so at, uh, at the time, uh, our group was working on two different uh, instruments. One was, was Moppet. And uh, Moppet was an instrument used for, um, for measuring uh, carbon monoxide and methane, which was launched uh, on a NASA's Terrace spacecraft in 99. And I was involved at the time a lot on the aircraft version of that instrument, uh, which uh, led me to go to places like California and South Africa to help uh, to help uh, fly and operate uh, the, the instrument. I didn't fly, but the uh, help uh, collect the data and uh, make sure the instrument was running properly. So that led me to start a PhD in that group. and. Uh, for my PhD, I worked on another satellite instrument, which was called, uh, uh, well, SISAT, and which had two instruments. One is a Fourier transform spectrometer and another one, which is a grading spectrometer, so ACE, FTS, and MAESTRO. And um, the goal of the mission is, again, for atmospheric sensing. In, in this case, it was by the way it works is the satellite will look at the sun uh, setting. So every time it goes around the orbit, it will see the sunrise and then the sunset. And then by looking at the uh, attenuation of sunlight by different components in the atmosphere at different levels, uh, you're able to then apply some inverse methods and figure out what is the composition of, of the uh, atmosphere at different layers. So, uh, and one of the prime motivations uh, at the time was ozone, because there was obviously a lot of concern about the, uh, the ozone layer. So, so this was uh, this is what I did uh, from 2000 2006, and I worked a lot in laboratory characterization. Um, so, and uh, along that the way, a lot of things that I learned, which were useful for industry, uh, I learned a whole bunch of stuff about you know radiative transfer, remote sensing, spectroscopy, inverse methods. Um, these were all things that in one way or another uh, were useful for me in, uh, in my later, later jobs uh, in industry. And as well as how, how does a whole, how, how do you run uh, a space instrument uh, program? You know, the, all, the, all the different steps, the, uh, the planning, uh, the, the phases, all of that stuff. Uh, how, do you, how do you do tests on instruments? So I learned a lot of, of really useful skills. And I think one of the keys that, um, one of the themes that I'm coming to both for my PhD or MSc is that in both cases, I joined very fairly large research groups that had some ties to industry. So that helped, um, that helped me a lot, uh, to, uh, to find jobs afterwards and to, uh, through connections. So this is just, uh, just to show you a little bit about how these, how these, uh, instruments work just out of curiosity. So Moppet, which was built by by Comdev, uh, which is now Honeywell and in, uh, in uh, Cambridge. So this was an instrument that uses uh, correlation spectroscopy. So what that means is that you have a cell, a gas cell of, uh, of the gas that you want to measure that you use inside the instrument. 
and then you uh, it, you modulate the uh, amount of gas uh, either by varying the pressure or length. And actually, Moppet had uh, the ability to do both. And then uh, by analyzing this modulated signal, uh, you're able to uh, determine what the concentration of the gas is in the in the atmosphere. So this was uh, pretty much one of the first uh, instruments uh, to use this principle, uh, and it's still working today, I believe. Um, uh, so uh, it was a, a very successful uh, Canadian uh, technology. Uh, and another one that, that I worked on, which was also, so all these companies were built by, by, uh, by Canadian uh, companies. The other one was uh, on SISAT. There were two instruments. There was Maestro, which was a UV grading spectrometer, and ACE-FTS, which is an infrared Fourier transform spectrometer. And that was built by Bowman, which is now ABB in Quebec City. And this is just to give you an idea of uh, the, the complexity of, of, the, uh, of the optical uh, design that goes into that. Uh, so in this case, this was a, a Michelson interferometer. So you have these moving arms to uh, create interference patterns. And this was, uh, uh, so this is used, this is a very common technique uh, for return spectroscopy in, um, in, uh, in the infrared region. It allows you to have a very fine spectral resolution for measuring uh, gases. So, um, and then, say, like I was saying before, then because you're looking at attenuated sunlight at different layers, you can use uh, inverse method spectral fitting techniques to, uh, to figure out what the uh, composition of the atmosphere is. So these were all very interesting instruments, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, being a part of, of that. However, then I took another left turn uh, after that um, into the world of startup uh, companies. Uh, in a company called Picomol Instruments. So this was uh, a colleague of mine that I'd met while I was doing my, um, my PhD studies, uh, had been working on a technology called cavity ring down spectroscopy. And he, was, uh, he wanted to start his own company uh, using this technology to analyze human breath. So um, he asked me if I wanted to join. I said, yes. So I was one of the founding members of, of Picomol Instruments and I, was, I served as vice president of technology development, which may sound impressive, but there was only four people. So we could afford to give ourselves fancy titles. But essentially, um, I, uh, so I moved to Edmonton for that. I was there from 2006 to 2010. And um, so we were successful in, in the, I was, I helped uh, lead the development of the prototype uh, for this uh, instrument. And essentially how in uh, two seconds, how does cavity uh, ring down work is you have a laser source that you can tune to uh, different frequencies in the infrared, you chop it, and then um, the, uh, the chopped light will bounce around in the cavity and decay. Uh, so it will decay for two reasons. One, because the mirror is not 100% reflecting. And the other reason is if you have a, if you put a gas in here, um, it will also, depending on the frequency, uh, attenuate uh, the gap, the uh, the light that's bouncing back and forth. So what you do is you, you then have a little bit of a mirror is not 100% uh, reflective, so you have a little bit of leakage that you detect on an infrared sensor. And by looking at the decay time uh, and measuring the the, the decay time constant, exponential decay. Uh, and comparing with the one with and without the sample, you can figure out with a extremely high precision, it turns out, um, uh, what, the, uh, what, what the composition of the gas is here. So this is kind of like, uh, allows you to measure down to about points per billion um, uh, concentrations. So uh, this, the startup experience was very interesting for me. Uh, one of the things that you, uh, you learn when you're in a small company is to be resourceful. You don't have a lot of money. You have to figure out how to do prototypes on the cheap. Sometimes you, you buy stuff on eBay and you know stuff like that. It doesn't. Sometimes the equipment that doesn't work out as you as you expect. And also you have to wear your businessman hat. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the CEO of the company ended up um, spending all his time trying to raise funds and money and, and investments. And so that kind of left me kind of trying to head uh, the technology development. Which, which was fine with me, but it's something to keep in mind if, uh, for, for those who uh, want to get into business that um, you know, if you choose to be the CEO, you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, spending most of your time, unfortunately, or fortunately uh, finding money rather than doing the technology. Uh, yeah, so I did that for, for four years and um, 
Picomol and Picomol still exists nowadays, by the way, and they're they're now look, they've moved to Moncton, uh, New Brunswick, and they seem to be doing uh, pretty well these days. They're they, they're looking at they're doing clinical trials. Um, uh, like everyone else, they're interested in in seeing uh, what they can do um, with COVID. I know they've been doing some COVID trials. The main application of interest we had at the time was lung cancer, and uh, uh, that's still being pursued. And um, yeah, so that was a very, and another thing uh, maybe I'll mention before I move to the next is um, that uh, often uh, what you find when you're doing stuff like this is um, that uh, you anticipate all kinds of problems, technical problems that turn out to be not a problem, but then a whole bunch of other things become problems that you hadn't anticipated. So you have to, uh, I think uh, having a, a training as a physicist to kind of think creatively and, and to really understand the interactions between different things um, can help. So just to give an example, uh, it turned out that, you know, the, the technical issues, uh, the optical issues around the cavity ring down, which we anticipated to have lots of problems, turned out to be much less than just the fact of how do you sample a human breath and put it into the, into the cavity. Uh, that turned out to be um, the main problem that we had actually. And so we had to, to, uh, to, to figure out how to sample it. So we came up with this, this is a, was, was kind of a, a side patent, but that turned out to be very crucial to, um, to what we were doing. Uh, so, so it's just, this module was just, uh, used to, um, to concentrate human breath on, uh, on little sorbent tubes that were then injected in the cavity. So we had to, we had to develop this whole other side technology, um, in order for it, for this part, the main part uh, to work. So, and when you're doing that with a company with just a few people, it can be very exciting, but it can also be very uh, <laughs> frustrating and, and stressful. Uh, if you don't have a lot of people you can, uh, you can talk to. So then um, I moved on and I've been with INO uh, since 2010. And so uh, I know is the National Optics Institute in uh, Quebec City, uh, the headquarters in Quebec City, but we also have two uh, small uh, business development offices, one in Hamilton and one in Montreal. I'm actually now in the, uh, located uh, in Montreal. Um, and I've been working, uh, I started out working as a research scientist there and uh, now I'm more an application scientist, which means that um, a little bit more on the business development side. And uh, I know, what is I know? Well, it's a private institute of translation, translational applied research. So we do applied research, meaning that uh, unlike um, universities, everything we do in terms of research has to have a, um, uh, an industrial uh, application to it or a commercial application, I should say. Uh, we were founded in 1988. Uh, we have about 200 employees, uh, annual budget around $40 million. And uh, one thing to note is about half of our employees have uh, advanced uh, degrees and there's a lot of physicists there. We have uh, several physics PhDs, masters, bachelors, and uh, as we'd expect a lot of, of engineers as well. And what is, what is our role at INO is we're kind of the interface between the academic world and the industrial world. So we're, we're kind of operating in that, in that middle space where uh, our job is really to look at what is being developed in the, um, in the academic world in optics and photonics uh, and use that, not that, that basic research and findings to see how we can uh, find solutions to problems in industry. So, so, um, so that's kind of like where we are. And, and my role right now as application scientist is I'm really at kind of at, at that intersection here where I'm trying to uh, keep it, keeping abreast of what, what is being uh, done in universities and in optics and photonics, but also looking at what's happening uh, in, in the real world and what are problems that I can, you can then kind of try to connect the dots and say, okay, well, you know, with, with these technologies that, that are being developed, um, uh, that are emerging, we can maybe solve such and such a problem. And we essentially take these early stage uh, research technologies and try to develop them into, a, into actual products that will assist the uh, industry. So it's a, a, a very interesting kind of a middle ground there that, that is, that is uh, 
And we do our own research too at INO. So, so if someone wants to propose a, a research project, uh, we can do that too. But of course, it has to fill uh, some identified um, need. So there, you have to be able to uh, to provide a business case with it. Uh, but if you can, if you can, then uh, you can go ahead and, and propose. Um, we have funding available for uh, for uh, doing research on optical and and photonics uh, projects. So we, uh, yeah, so we provide a complete range of services in optics, photonics, vision, and uh, we we work a lot on a on an integrated approach. So so we one of our goals really is to help uh, companies reduce the development time, iterations, costs, and risks. So you know uh, that's that we we have like a, a special um, uh, methods for doing that, and uh, we have customers all across Canada and the world. And uh, yeah, I see I have five minutes. It's good. Um, and and we've created tons of spin-off companies. So especially in the, in the Quebec City area, there's a huge concentration of, of optical companies, and a lot of that were kind of spin off spun off from INO, and they now form like this kind of optics and photonics uh, ecosystem uh, that that is doing uh, quite well. I think I think most of the companies that were spun off. Um, are still in existence, which is which is quite good. And we have business different business units, so defense, security, advanced manufacturing, sustainable resources, biomed. So we have people working in all kinds of uh, of fields. I'm I'm more on the defense, security, and aerospace uh, side. And just quickly talk about the, the main technology I, I've I've been working on is are, is microbolometer technology. So what are microbolometers? They're these tiny platforms that absorb incoming electromagnetic radiation and convert them into heat. And then what you do is you uh, have a you have a, a compound in there such a, a material such as vanadium oxide, which has a high change of resistance due to temperature. And so therefore, if you uh, read its resistance, you can figure out. Uh, how much heat was absorbed. So these you can make really small. Uh, so on the order of uh, now they're down to about 14 micron uh, pixels that you can make. So each of these pixels is a platform like this, which is uh, thermally isolated from the from the bottom to provide a, a good thermal uh, conductance. And there to and also to get the good thermal conductance, they're vacuum sealed in these packages. So at I know we we work on the whole chain. So we start off with these silicon wafers. Uh, we do microfabrication of the pixels, uh, the vacuum packaging, and develop the cameras themselves, which have optics, electronics, and everything. And you and this gives you an idea of the, the thermal imagers that you can um, that you can get using microbolometer uh, pixels. So, and on in terms of the applications for that, well, there, there's there's a whole bunch of applications that the the ones I've been working on the most have been related to wildfire measurements. So I've been working a lot with the Canadian Space Agency to develop um, wildfire sat, which is a, uh, a new, uh, a new uh, instrument uh, satellite system for measuring wildfires. Uh, previously, we had worked on uh, the NERST instrument, which was one of the first um, uh, satellite instruments to use uh, microbolometer pixels. Another interesting uh, application of microbolometers that INO has been working on is, is, is to detect terahertz rays. So terahertz are between uh, infrared and, and radiative waves, so they can penetrate certain objects. And so you can do see-through imaging. So for example, this is a, um, uh, we have a spin-off company that called RaySecure that, that uh, uses our technology to uh, be able to uh, see through envelopes. So, you know, that gives you seeing an example of the sorts of things you can do with, with terahertz. And this is kind of a, a niche market. And now we're, we're looking at how to use that more for, uh, yeah. but perhaps one day airport screening, uh, you can actually see if someone's carrying a knife uh, under, uh, under clothing and, and stuff like that. So very interesting um, applications for, for microbolometers. So I don't know how much time I have left, but this you can see here. This tried to summarize a bit some of the lessons learned uh, that helped me um, in terms of uh, of um, pursuing a career in industry with a physics background. So you know, optics photonics is a is a field that has a, a high industrial demand, and it, it, I'm sure it's going to keep growing uh, in the future. Uh, it's good to choose large research groups if you want to end up uh, with a uh, an industrial uh, job. 
because you get a lot of networking opportunities. You, you meet a lot of people. Learning transferable programming skills, electronic stuff like that is all very good. Good communication skills. You have to be able to you know, be concise and to communicate effectively with non-specialists. Uh, what else? Yeah, another thing is that you know, systems engineering um, is, is kind of like a, a specialty, but uh, physicists can often make good systems engineers. Uh, because you have to be able to understand all these different uh, physical phenomena and how they interact with each other. Uh, so so um, that's kind of where, why I kind of, in a way, became more of a, of a systems engineer over, over the years, even though I'm not officially an engineer. And, uh, you know, things to keep in mind as uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, people in academia, academia, you can have a, a tendency to have try to make everything perfect, but in industry, there's always budgets to keep in mind. So Having a sense of what when it is good enough, uh, you know, is, is very important. Um, and always keep learning. And you know, team spirit. If you want to um, to work in industry well with a team, you have to uh, you have to be able to uh, to work well as a team and uh, everything that 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 implies. Uh, you'll go much further than being a, a narrow individualist uh, mindset. So that's uh, that's about it for me. Oh. Thank you, Denis. That was uh, excellent. And it was a great summary. And I know you missed the initial talk uh, from Crystal Bailey, but you've summarized uh, a lot of her points right here. And uh, I can verify, having having worked with Denis as, 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 as a collaborator, he does all these things. <laughs> so I says, yes, this is all true. <laughs> um, are there any questions from the, from the uh, audience? Just raise your hand if you, uh, hopefully I'll see you. Maud, do you have to see anything? Sorry, did you say? No, did you, do you um, see any hands? Cause I, my screen no, is- No, I don't. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, I have a question. <laughs> so, Denis, uh, so what what aspect of um, of this of all the things you've done so far do you find the most um, satisfying? Um, I like I'm I've always uh, liked problem solving. So, uh, in in all of these things, um, you have these challenges, and you're trying to figure out if, how to how to do something. So. Um, just, just the creative aspect of it. And problem solving is not always just technical, but it can also, now I'm doing more on the business side and that, that is, it, it's itself often problem solving. Like how do you, uh, how, how do you create a solution uh, not only that is technically feasible, but um, you know, that is cost effective or that, that you can, uh, you can secure that there's a, a supply chain and, and this and that and, and provide it. The, so, it's all, it's all about problem solving. And so that's one thing. And, and I working at, I know specifically uh, what I enjoy is that um, it's very, um, th there's so many different things that, that you're working on. You're not just working on, on one, on one particular um, product or solution. Uh, there, there's, there's so many different applications of, of optics and photonics that I find myself. And, and, and that means that, that you're always learning. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. These are the kind of things that, that I find interesting. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, if there are no questions, I'll just, I'll just mention that Denis will be on the panel uh, later after, after Al's talk. Uh, so you can, if you haven't thought about anything, you can think about it and get him then.